Bret Hart wanted to reward fans who watched as closely as they could. Making sure both his character and match layout was as layered as possible, he approached wrestling like it was the most serious and real thing in the world, right down to the small things, and that's what Blink-182 was singing about. For example, when he took on Brother Owen, he didn't think he could beat him because he was just an asshole. He thought he could beat him because he was the older and better sibling. Others such as Kenta Kabashi also had this magic manifest itself in its own way, and it kind of comes down to the the fact that wrestlers never have a day off. I mean, the touring schedule in WWE, for example, isn't what it once was, but when you pull on a pair of tights or a pair of pants, you need to be on all of the time. Must be really tiring. Thankfully, this skill is still being utilized today, so let's heap some praise upon some wrestlers right now. My name is Simon Miller, this is What Culture Wrestling, and this is also 10 wrestlers who reward you for paying attention. Number 10, Hiroshi Tanahashi. New Japan's ace uses one signal signature move to dramatic effect. He relies on the dragon screw multiple times throughout a match, always ensures it makes sense, and somehow, despite all that, no one ever sees it coming. It's like a magic trick. It's also completely safe compared to what is the current flavor of the modern day world of wrestling. And he has sold it so well to the audience, they react to it like he's just pulled a gun out of his pants and shot somebody. On occasion, it has even drawn gasps from the crowd. Tanahashi is still doing this, maybe to even better effect, even though he's ravaged with injuries, and it's why many are saying that he is the master of ring psychology. He uses everything as much as he can and gets the most out of it on the other side. A great example of this is when he clashed with Jay White in the finals of the Best of the Super Juniors, and it was honestly like he would have broken his leg had he gotten the chance. It's this mindset that will likely see him wrestling for many years to come, even though he's battling knees that are long past their best. Number nine, Johnny Gargano. It was a bit weird when Johnny Gargano started telling us how much he hated wheels. While it may have been true, it wasn't something that fans needed to know. Like, if I tell you I don't like going to bed without my socks on, you're gonna be like, man, Simon Miller, he's such a heathen, but it's true. But it doesn't help this video in any sense, it just doesn't matter. With Johnny though, all of this was wonderfully paid off when he had to spin a wheel for Halloween Havoc to decide his fate. But not only was he able to overcome that, however, he leaped around the actual wheel to spike Damian Priest and become the new North American champion. And you know what happened after that? Gargano flipping loved wheels because of course he did. This has summed up his new character though. Bad guy Johnny is constantly making references like this and nodding back to the past and he acts like an absolute goof constantly. He basically made what seemed like a pointless wink incredibly powerful, but only if you were looking out for it to begin with which is why Rey Mysterio struggles. Number eight, John Moxley. John Moxley not only gets you pumped when he cuts a promo, but he also just tells you what is gonna happen in his matches. Before he fought Brian Cage, he said he was gonna rip the bicep from the bone, and he would have done too if it wasn't for Taz, a submission expert who saw the problem and stopped it from happening. He also warned Eddie Kingston to watch his next before wrapping barbed wire around his arm and sticking it in his throat. See, this is top draw babyface work because not only is he telling his audience the truth, but he's also drowning in confidence. You don't want your heroes to be scared senseless, you want them to be warriors ready for battle, and that is the Mox. He never screams this either, which gives him an extra edge, and the real key is that it doesn't make his fights predictable. At no point did I call either of the mentioned endings, meaning he has this finely balanced. He also sells like a champion which helps because he is a champion. So if you pay attention and believe him, he will reward you. I tell you, I don't want to be that guy, but WWE really did miss the boat. Number seven, the Young Bucks. Full Gear 2020 was full of hints like this, no less because FTR lost their tag team championships after they went against their own no flip mantra, went for a 450 splash, and yeah, they missed should have stuck to what brought them to the dance. You can't take anything away from Cash and Dax, but on the other side to this, you have Matt and Nick Jackson, who have this kind of art, that's right, I said it, down to a T. Be it when they were in New Japan and Matt sold his back like he was never gonna be able to walk again, or how he used this experience to try and inflict the same pain on Isaiah Cassidy of Private Party, who was the more high-flying of the pair, they tell consistently great stories, even though their haters like to pretend they're just spot monkeys, and I will stand here and say it, it's not true. Both Matt and Nick have also become master sellers, right down to Nick realizing that he may be in a little bit of a pickle because of his brother's ailments. 
That is no accident, it is planned. You may not even see these small narrative points unless you're looking for them, but that is the whole point of this list. Open your eyes and see them in a whole new light. And I've made my one Rey Mysterio joke per video, so I'm not doing it again. Number six, Kaja Chika Akada. I once saw an entire arena lose their minds when Akada revealed that he had new slash old entrance gear. I mean, how the hell was he able to do that? It doesn't make any sense. This manifested itself once more after his loss to Kenny Omega at Dominion 2018 because the former IWGP champion melted down. And it wasn't over the top or in your face. He simply took a step back from all the bells and whistles that were a part of his act to underline there had been a change. There was no melodrama here. But then when he brought it back at Wrestle Kingdom 13, fans lost it. And there was even more to this because it had a purpose. A card lost to Jay White on this evening and it was a massive deal because of the version Jay had beaten. It was the best iteration. The guy who had owned New Japan for years, the mighty had fallen. This continued when he decided to change up his finisher during the 2020 G1 Climax Tournament. And again, the point of that is so that when he does go back to the Rainmaker, the audience will rejoice like an old friend has come back from the dead. Don't think this is all a fluke either. It's clearly been the plan from the start. Number five, Tomohiro Ishii. Ishii isn't really the week to week story type of wrestler. He tells his tales in the ring, meaning every time he does step into the squared circle, you never know what you're gonna get. I tell you who does though, he does. It's yet even more magic you're gonna get from this crazy sport. And if you're looking to suspend your disbelief and invest in an emotional fighting performance, this is the guy you wanna watch. Even if you've never witnessed, just try one of his matches. His selling alone will get you into it because he acts like his whole body has been shot as opposed to just hurting one limb. It means when he crumples towards the end of a scrap because his body is weaker than his heart and his will to win, oh, well, I just tell you, it means any kind of comeback is even better than you think it could of it anyway. Where the hell is he finding this last ounce of strength? And look, as I say these words, Japanese crowds aren't allowed to shout or boo because of the global pandemic, but on more than one occasion, they have done this when Ishii has been in the ring without thinking, because they are totally lost in the ride. Number four, Sasha Banks and Bailey. The feud between these two has been WWE at its best. Aside from their NXT classic back in 2015, Everything they did as best friends and tag team champions was spot on. And also, if you had a more intrigued eye, you couldn't help but notice all the wry gestures. Whether it was Sasha looking at Bailey's title on every episode of SmackDown or the subtle digs they kept taking at each other, which clearly hit a nerve, you knew that something bad was gonna happen eventually, you just didn't know when, which is why you tuned in. It ended with Banks winning the title, but it's been so well crafted and so well layered, we can easily go back to this whenever we want and it will make perfect sense. The breadcrumbs have been put down and you just have to follow them whenever you fancy it. That is how all wrestling stories should go, but only the best can pull it off. Number three, Cody Rhodes. What hasn't Cody Rhodes done this year? I mean, he even went and got his last name back. But as well as that, he's also played the underdog getting his ass kicked courtesy of Brody Lee, but then also been the arrogant veteran when he faced Darby Allen. His alignment shifts when he needs to, whereas his character stays consistent. And also, who has told better stories in the ring recently than him? This is me waiting for the answer. Before this TNT title loss to Allen as well, he was going on about focusing on bigger challenges in AEW because he now considered himself a giant killer. But that just showed that he was taking Darby too lightly. He felt like he had the rookie's number, maybe because he was the smaller grappler, and then came back to kick him in the ass. And don't forget that program basically went for a whole year too. I mean, it wasn't referenced every week, but it was used as a constant callback. Much like Banks and Bailey, you can return to this as well because there's still so many unanswered questions. And once again, that should always be the case when you get pro wrestling right. I'm very passionate about it. Number two, Hangman Page. Before All Out, Hangman Page cost the Young Bucks their title rematch. Just as Nick Jackson was gonna hit the Meltzer driver, the cowboy grabbed his friend's leg to stop him and the sheer conflict on his face was money. This then happened again at All Out when Paige grabbed Cash Wheeler's leg as he was going to superplex Kenny Omega. And let's not pretend that wasn't meant to be a wink wink nod nod. It absolutely was. The whole idea is that Paige is going through struggles that we all do in day to day life and trying to figure out what's the best thing to do and where he fits. It's why despite doing all this kind of bad stuff, he has sympathy with the fans. He does keep screwing up 
but you can understand how he got there. When he finally finds himself and wins the AEW world title, it is gonna be Red Dead Redemption at its best. And I just meant Redemption, it's a good game. It's also why there's this conspiracy theory that it's actually Hangman Page who attacked John Moxley and left him bloodied on a recent Dynamite. He doesn't want Omega to win the big one for two reasons. One, he can't handle the fact he lost to Kenny at full gear, but two, he is still desperate for that tag team to reunite because it was there he felt the most comfortable. It is the longest term story AEW has told so far, and at the moment, it is just ticking every box. Number one, Kenny Omega. And this will kick up a stink, but Kenny Omega could be one of the most detailed pro wrestlers ever. No one adds as much subtext to his matches or character as he does, to the point, even if you miss all of it, you can still enjoy his matches. That's nuts! Just go invest some time in his golden lover story with Kota Ibushi, or when he missed that Phoenix Splash at Full Gear 2019. It was sold that the great Kenny Omega, or the former great Kenny Omega, was not the guy we were used to seeing and cheering the year prior. And let's not forget that all ties into his resurgence in 2020. Even though it's been months since he teamed with Ibushi too, he's still been using their moves and then not using their moves depending where currently he is with his persona. And if you can keep up with all of that, then more power to you. I mean, to be honest, it's a mystery how Kenny himself is able to do it. But it is why he is one of the best wrestlers in the world, or for my money anyway, he would shine in any company for all these reasons and more. And I can't wait until he beats John Moxley for the AEW world title. And if you watch this after that match has happened and I'm wrong, well, I'm living in the past. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below and let me know which ones of these do you agree with and which ones of these don't you agree with and how much do you hate my bald ass. Like the video, share the video, subscribe to the channel, head over to whatculture.com, read yourself some articles, follow what culture on Twitter, what culture WWE. Watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always. I think I'll see you soon.